Welcome back. I'm so glad that you're here. It's finally gotten cold here in Colorado. It's like minus 20 today, and we've gotten a little bit of snow, which is really great news because we've been very, very dry here. But I digress. We're looking at the Adoration of the Magi today because this week starts Epiphany. When I was in university, I spent my first two years doing a degree in astrophysics, and I've always loved astronomy and thought it would be a good fit. Didn't turn out that way though. But one of the things I've learned since then is that we have so much light pollution today that you actually have to find specialized maps that will show you where you can experience what they call dark skies. No light pollution to spoil your view of the night sky. Prior to 1850, this was not the case. In fact, it was the exception where you actually had outdoor lighting at night. People in the ancient world did not experience much light pollution. They were very familiar with the night sky. They saw it in all of its glory almost every night, especially in the Middle East. They knew the stars, the constellations, and the movements of the wanderers, the planets, very, very well. So when Matthew tells us the story of the wise men coming to see Jesus because they saw his star in the heavens, this is something that anyone back then would immediately relate to. And they would naturally ask, which star? What sign did they see? Why didn't we see it? We also need to introduce another idea to help us understand this story, and that is the cosmology of ancient Judaism. To boil it down into a nutshell, the heavens above was where God dwelled. The earth below is where human life was carried out. And the two realms, while separated, were related and interacted with each other. God made the heavens and the earth in Genesis 1. So when the Magi say that they've seen a star, the ancient reader would naturally assume and see this as some form of divine revelation. The star they saw was a sign from above in the heavens where God dwells, and they responded to that revelation. If you're new here, welcome to the Caffeinated Bible. My name is David Paris, and the goal of this channel is to take what I've been teaching, researching, and writing at the graduate level and in seminaries for the past 20 or more years. Hopefully these videos will encourage and stimulate you in your own faith and discovery and exploration of the Bible. If so, please subscribe, give these videos a thumbs up, and hit that share button and let somebody else know about it. This is the best way I know to help grow this channel and its presence on YouTube. So back to the Magi. If you don't come from a liturgical church type background, you need to realize that the season after Christmas is called Epiphany. The Feast of Epiphany is one of the earliest days in the church's liturgical calendar. Epiphany comes from the Greek word epiphanei, and it means appearance or manifestation. By 200 AD, the church in Egypt at least was observing the Feast of Epiphany. However, the epiphany that they focused on was Jesus' baptism when God spoke from the clouds and declared, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Definitely a divine manifestation or epiphany. Once the church decided to observe Christ's birth on December 25th, Epiphany shifted from Jesus' baptism to the wise men coming from the east. This is a natural fit because the story of the Magi is related to Jesus' birth in the Gospel of Matthew, and it made sense to place this observance close to that of Christmas as well. Matthew clearly intended for this story to be read and understood as a manifestation of God's plan of salvation to the Gentiles, so it made sense theologically to place it on the Feast of Epiphany. By 450 AD, by 450 AD, most of the Western Church was remembering the visit of the Magi for the Feast of Epiphany. Now, in last week's video, I touched a little on the history of how the Magi have been interpreted, and really, I have an entire video on that from last January. The link will be up over here or in the See More section underneath the video. So, if you're interested in the long story of how the Church has interpreted who the Magi were and what they represent over the past 2,000 years, see one of those videos. This week, I want to focus primarily on the text in Matthew. Who were the Magi? 
In reality, we only have a few clues to their identity in the text. First, they were from the east. Now, this might be a reference to Persia, Babylon, or Assyria, where Israel was in captivity in the Old Testament. Or it might be a reference back to the Garden of Eden, which was in the east. We're really not sure. It's a very, very vague reference. Second, they were wealthy, or we assume them to be wealthy. The gifts they brought are clear indications of wealth, but how wealthy? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh might sound like really extravagant gifts, but remember, if you're traveling in a caravan by camels or on foot, you want portable wealth that you can bring. And gold is very, very small and dense, so you can bring a lot of it with little effort. The same thing with frankincense and myrrh. They are very, very dense forms of wealth. Third, they were not Jewish. Otherwise, we would have seen much more interest in the text with their visit to Jerusalem, possibly to the temple, rather than just a quick consultation with Herod about where this king would be born and then skedaddling back to their homeland. This week, I want to focus on the story of the Magi in Matthew 2, verses 1 through 12. Actually, it's the only place where the story is found. And a couple of theological themes found in this passage that are introduced and run throughout Matthew's gospel. So let's read the text. Matthew 2, verses 1 through 12, and I'm reading from the Holman Christian Standard Bible today. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of King Herod, wise men from the east arrived unexpectedly in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born King of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King heard this, he was deeply disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. So he assembled all the chief priests and the scribes of the people and asked them where the Messiah would be born. In Bethlehem of Judea, they told him, because this is what has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah, because out of you will come a leader who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly summoned the wise men and asked them the exact time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child, and when you find him, report back to me so that I too can go and worship him. After hearing the king, they went on their way, and there it was, the star they had seen in the east, and it led them until it came and stopped above the place where the child was born. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed beyond measure. Entering the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and falling to their knees, they worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their own country by another route. Theme number one, the star. This has been the subject of a great deal of speculation from the moment that Matthew laid down his stylus. Some think it was a conjunction of the planets which took place around 7 or 6 BC, another one around 5 or 4 BC. However, the narrative does not support this as the star that led them to Bethlehem. Because notice, after they leave Jerusalem, they see the star again. They saw it in the east, now they see it again. But this time it's going to take them southwest of Jerusalem and it's going to stand over the place where Jesus is. Not the city, it's going to give a very, very specific location in the story here. The fact that no one in Jerusalem or Jesus' parents knew about this heavenly apparition shows that it was not a major astronomical event that was widely seen or perceived by others. Rather, it should be more seen in terms of a divine leading or revelation. Why? Because Matthew uses this idea of the heavens above and the earth below, the sun, moon, stars, heaven, and earth, throughout his gospel at key points to teach us something theologically important. So let's take a look at these. The first reference to these sort of cosmological type configurations is here in this story. The Magi have seen his star. The heavens themselves are speaking about Jesus' birth. The Magi saw it loud and clear. And this is in line with other passages in the Bible. Oftentimes in the Bible, angelic beings are spoken of in terms of stars. 
When the serpent fell from heaven, he swept his tail and took one third of the stars in heaven with him. Now this is a picturesque way to depict Satan's rebellion and how he deceived others who bought into his big lie. The second reference to Matthew's cosmology is in chapter 6, the Lord's Prayer, chapter 6, verses 9 through 10. Our Father in heaven, your name be honored as holy, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And that last line I really don't like, and I think it comes across clear. In Greek it reads, as in heaven, so also on earth. It forms a beautiful transition because the prayer opens with our Father in heaven and it closes with us praying and asking God for our daily bread and forgiving one another. So we see this transition from the heavens above to the earth below. One of the main themes in the Lord's Prayer is that what God is doing in heaven would also be realized on earth as well. A melding of the two domains. The third reference to Matthew's cosmology is in Matthew 17 verses 1 through 18, the story of the epileptic boy. Now this story opens with the transfiguration, Jesus going up on the mountain with Peter, James, and John. And then while they are up there, Jesus is transfigured right before them. Verse 2 tells us that Jesus was transformed in front of them and his face shone like the sun, and even his clothes became white as the light. Now this is a theophany or an epiphany. Jesus is divinely manifested and it is very interesting that he shines like the sun. When they descend from the mountain and rejoin the crowd at the base of the mountain, one of the men in the crowd runs up and kneels before Jesus and pleads with him, Lord, have mercy on my son because he has seizures and suffers severely. He often falls into the fire and often into water. I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. Verses 15 and 16. This is one of those passages that really gets translators tripped up. They can translate in a manner that communicates clearly to the contemporary reader, or they can stick to the Greek. The Holman Christian Standard Bible, like many other translations today, translate this as he has seizures or he is an epileptic. The Greek word, on the other hand, tells us that he has struck by the moon, selenades at tie. King James followed the Latin Vulgate when it translated this, and it says that the boy is a lunatic. Now that's pretty close to the Greek, luna for lunar, and that somehow the moon, the lunar, is influencing this child. But we don't like to use lunatic today because it doesn't really describe an ailment of the body so much, but more as somebody that's a little nuts. Here's the key point I want you to notice. On the mountaintop, Jesus shone like the sun. When he comes down from the mountain, he heals a boy that is struck by the moon. Matthew wants to notice that Jesus is Lord of the two great lights that God put in the sky in Genesis 1, the sun to rule the day and the moon the night. Jesus is Lord of the heavenly realms. The fourth reference to Matthew's cosmology comes at the very end of his gospel in Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. We have here what is called the Great Commission. Jesus commands his church to take the gospel to every corner of the world. He quotes Jesus as saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations or all the Gentiles. Now two themes introduced in the story of the Magi are bookended here in Matthew's gospel. First, that the Magi saw Jesus' star, which sets up the theme that Jesus is Lord of heaven and and earth. The second main theme introduced in the story of the Magi is that they were Gentiles coming to worship Christ. Now in Matthew's genealogy in Matthew chapter 1, we met Tamar, Rahab, and Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah. He won't even call her by the right name. And they were all Gentiles who are brought into Jesus' lineage. Now we meet the Magi. When Jesus moves to Capernaum and begins his public ministry in Matthew chapter 4, he quotes for us Isaiah 9 verses 1 through 2 to introduce what Galilee is like. Land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, 
along the sea road beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. Hold that thought in mind there. The people who live in darkness have seen a great light, and for those living in the shadow land of death, light has dawned. What's interesting about this is that during Jesus' day, Galilee was not primarily populated by Gentiles, but was primarily Jewish. However, when Isaiah wrote his text some 600 years earlier, Galilee had been conquered by the Assyrians, so it was Gentile territory then. So why does Matthew quote Isaiah about Galilee being of the Gentiles? I think there's a couple reasons for this. The first is that the passage's punchline, the people who live in darkness have seen a great light. This ties right back to the Magi's experience and picks up those themes. They have seen his star, his light in the night sky. The message of God's revelation is going to the Gentiles. Second, for Matthew, the light of salvation has broken forth into human history in the person of Jesus. So the location of his ministry, Capernaum, is where this light of salvation is dawning. And this theme of the Gentiles are all picked up in Matthew's use of Isaiah chapter 9. Almost 100 years ago, Gustav Dahlmann summed it up when he wrote, The loveliest lake of Palestine remains the place where God's redeeming power appeared to men for the first time on earth in a new guise, like a light. And thus was the prophetic word concerning the great light in the land of Zebulon and Naphtali abundantly fulfilled. If we continue our tour through Matthew's gospel for Gentiles, in chapter 15 we meet the Canaanite woman who's going to cry out to Jesus, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is horribly demon-possessed. And contrary to helping her at first, Jesus actually appears to insult her. He calls her a dog, but when she replies that even the dogs get the crumbs that fall from the table, he replies that, woman, your faith is great. At the very end of Matthew's gospel, Matthew 28, the Great Commission, the church is then commanded to take the message of this newborn king, the light of the world, to the Gentiles on every corner of the earth. And the Greek there, where it says, go therefore to all the nations, the nations Panta ta ethne in Greek, all the ethne. This can be ethnic groups, it can be peoples. Translated as nations like the United States or Canada or Mexico just doesn't work. It's more like ethnic groups of people. And so we are commanded to go to all these different groups of Gentiles in the world with this great news of the light of the world. The Magi came to worship Christ. Now the church is commanded to take that light to all the nations, the Gentiles of the world. In closing, I'd like to read a quote from John Calvin concerning this passage. Calvin wrote in his Harmony of the Gospels that the Heavenly Father chose to appoint the star and the Magi as our guides to lead us directly to his Son, while he stripped them of all earthly splendor for the purpose of informing us that his kingdom is spiritual. This history conveys profitable instruction, not only because God brought the Magi to his son as the first fruits of the Gentiles, but also because he appointed the kingdom of his son to receive their commendation, and that of the star for the confirmation of our faith. Until we come back next week, I hope you have a wonderful season of Epiphany. Remember, it lasts several weeks long. Peace.